our scripture reading this morning is going to be Luke chapter 2, 8 to 20. Luke chapter 2, 8 to 20. And if you're looking on the Pew Bible, that begins on page 1018, page 1018. Luke chapter 2, 8 to 20. Luke 2, beginning in verse 8. In the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you, you'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Well, let's pray before we look at this passage. Lord, again, we thank you for this season, and Lord, we thank you that uh, you came to earth to reveal yourself to us, and most of all, to save us, that rescue mission we were talking about earlier. And so, Lord, uh, may you show us those things, reveal yourself to us more through this passage, uh, show us more of how you're our Savior, uh, that we might call on your name for the first time or for many, many times. So bless this time, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Quite often in the Bible, the circumstances surrounding a person's birth and infancy foreshadow major events that will occur later in their life. For example, Jacob's delivered from the womb, holding on to the heel of his brother Esau, foreshadowing the day when Jacob will take the place in the family rank of his brother Esau. Uh, Jacob, or Israel as he's called, uh, would inherit the rights and blessing of the firstborn rather than Esau. Contrary to the norm, the older or the young, the older would serve the younger. Another example is Moses, whose name means drawn out. As a baby, as you know, Moses was hidden in the Nile River and then saved as he was drawn out from the river by Pharaoh's daughter, who named him Moses or drawn out for that reason. And this was a foreshadowing, of course, how one day God would draw Moses out of the Red Sea and all of Israel to form a people for himself. Thus, the events surrounding Moses' birth and infancy contain a preview of coming attractions in his life, we see in the scriptures. This narrative of Jesus' birth and the shepherds witnessing, witnessing it seems to fall into this category as well, as many elements in the story here uh, seem to foreshadow what would happen later in Jesus' life. For example, this uh, account seems to point to how Jesus would one day serve as an offering for sins, like the sacrificial lambs in the temple, verses 8 and 9. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. The area around Bethlehem was known for its excellent grazing pasture. And since Bethlehem's only about five miles from Jerusalem, uh, many of the sheep for the temple sacrifices were cared for there in Bethlehem. It's possible then that the sheep these shepherds were watching were intended for this purpose. If so, this would have been a fitting place, a fitting setting for which the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world to enter into the world in entering the world amidst sheep who were destined to be 
sacrifice to pay for people's sins. Jesus would have been coming into the world in a sense among his own because that was his destiny as well. The circumstances surrounding Jesus' birth also seem to foreshadow the fact that he would be an outcast who had come primarily to reach outcasts because that's whom he arrived among. We know from slightly later documents that shepherds were held in little regard uh, in, at that time. And this likely was the case in Jesus' day. For example, in later documents, we're told that uh, shepherds weren't allowed to testify in court because their testimony was considered untrustworthy. Their work was a 24-7 occupation, so they didn't have a time, time for the finer uh, ceremonial details of law, like hand washings and things like that. They also were known to do business with Gentiles at times. Seems highly likely then that the religious leaders of the day would not have respected them. They would have considered them unclean and therefore outcasts. Uh, William Hendrickson also points out that since the shepherd's life was a somewhat nomadic one, they had a reputation for uh, taking unauthorized souvenirs <laughs> from the various places they would go. They had a rep reputation for conf confusing thine with mine, as he puts it. Back then, the shepherds would come through your neighborhood, and you look out the kitchen window, and you say, didn't, didn't we have, used to have three garden gnomes? Uh, whether this reputation was fully deserved or not, I mean, these shepherds in Luke 2 seem to be of high character. It, this reputation was probably out there. Shepherds weren't held in high esteem at that time. And yet God chose them to be the first witnesses to the birth of his son in the world. Jesus arrived among outcasts so he could show mercy to outcasts. And this is a major characteristic of his future life and ministry, especially in the, in the Gospel of Luke. Jesus had also arrived among shepherds because he was to be a shepherd himself. I am the good shepherd. In the Old Testament, kings and rulers were called shepherds at times because their job was to lead and care for, God, for the people like a flock. Uh, likewise, in the New Testament, the leaders who shepherd or lead God's people, God's flock, are called shepherds. The word pastor is the Latin word for shepherd. Jesus had come then as a shepherd among shepherds because he was going to be that shepherd king who would lead God's people and care for them just as the Old Testament had prophesied regarding the Messiah. Uh, Micah tells us that God's coming king will be born in Bethlehem, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall dwell secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. In a way, then, Jesus' coming to the shepherds was kind of a courtesy call, right? Uh, he came to his fellow shepherds first as a professional courtesy, as one shepherd to a bunch of others. For he had come to be a shepherd of sorts also. And it's possible, too, that the same could be said of his appearing to the wise men or kings first also. Uh, he was also paying them a courtesy call uh, because he, too, would grow up to be a king and a wise man like them. They were in the same profession. It was fitting then that Jesus had come among these outcast shepherds as he was destined to be an outcast also. But also fitting that he had called these wise men who had also believed. For Jesus didn't just come to call the poor and, and the outcast, but anyone who would receive him. Poor and rich alike, great or small. This good news of great joy is for all the people, as the angel says in verse 10. But the Lord does have a special place in his heart for outcasts. Uh, he welcomes them gladly into his kingdom, and, and he puts them to good use there. Uh, back during World War II, one of our most effective spies was a, a Filipino woman by the name of Josefina Guerrero. Uh, over the course of the war in the Pacific, she played a critical role in smuggling in information and weapons and supplies to the resistant fighters and to our troops. And this led to many gains and many victories. She was a hero. 
The reason she was so successful was that she was a leper. And all the Japanese soldiers were afraid to search her. Here was an outcast who was put to great and noble service for a nation. And so it is in God's kingdom also. He takes outcasts, brings them into his kingdom, and puts them to a service, to great service there. Happily, Josephina was later cured of her leprosy after the war when treatments came out, and she lived to be 78. Well, verse 12 reinforces this idea that Jesus will be an outcast, and even more than that, a man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. A, a baby in a manger would be a sign to them because as one is noted, there weren't that many babies in Bethlehem, but only one in a manger. This unusual sight would confirm the message for them. It would be like if someone told us, go to this little town and look for the baby in the garage sleeping in a wheelbarrow. <laughs> It would stick out, right? We'd, we'd say, oh, this really was from God. Here again in Jesus' surroundings, we see a preview of coming events in his life. He's not going to be the kind of Messiah people expect him to be. Uh, we would have expected him, of course, to be born in a palace or a mansion uh, amidst the trappings of wealth and power and honor. But instead, he's born into poverty, and his birth is unheralded except for the heavenly host and outcasts on earth. He's born outside the camp, so to speak. He's already excluded from polite society, even as a baby, because there's no room for him in the end. Even as a baby, he's a man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. He came to his ancestral hometown of Bethlehem, and no one would take him in. He came to his own, but his own received him not. And this was a sign of things to come. The, the Messiah wasn't going to find himself in mansions and palaces, but in poverty and rejection. He'd suffer outside the camp, which might have been foreshadowed in still another way here, because as David Jeremiah points out, archaeologists have uncovered many mangers in Israel. And the vast majority of them are carved out of stone, and they look like little tombs, actually. And so it could be that Jesus, most likely Jesus was put on a rock that looked like a little tomb. If that was the case, it really foreshadowed who he was <laughs> and who he would be. That this was a Messiah who had come first not to conquer, but to die. Again, even as a baby, it seemed he would be a man of sorrows and one acquainted with grief. But the good news is that this passage also tells us that Jesus came as a savior. And indeed, that is because of his suffering that will be saved. And the angel said to him, fear not, for behold, I give you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. He came to his own and his own received him not. But to as many who received him, such as these outcasts, uh, shepherds, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus was born in poverty, and he's also born in the poor in spirit who will believe in him, as one author notes. To cite another, people want to be saved from all kinds of things, from debt, from a bad marriage, from, from other people's sins. But Jesus came to save us from the most important thing, from our own sins. Because when our sins are forgiven, we have peace with God, which leads to peace with other people, which leads to peace with our circumstances, which leads to peace within. In short, it leads to shalom. God's peace is overall blessing in our lives. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. What is a good conscience and peace of mind worth to you? What value, what price can you put on that? Many people spend a lot of money in vain, unfortunately, in pursuit of inner peace. But this baby, this Christ child can give it to you for free. 
All you have to do is ask me. The Stoic philosopher Epictetus once wrote, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. Jesus, the Prince of Peace, can give you the peace of heart that no earthly government, no earthly ruler can. He is our peace, as Micah said. There's another aspect of Jesus' future ministry this passage points to, if more indirectly. And this occurred to me as I read a comment from Warren Wearsby. Jesus was born in a lowly manger, but the lowly manger was a holy of holies because Jesus was there. Where Jesus is present, the lowliest manger becomes a magnificent temple of God with God's glory shining through. this baby would be a way then by which we could measure our worth. Let me explain what I mean by that. Whoever you are, you already have dignity and worth as a human being because you are created in God's image. But if you're a believer, that's even more so the case. Because Christ dwells in you, making you a holy of holies also. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, whom you have from God? Your self-worth should be grounded in the fact that God values you. No matter what anyone else has to say about you, no matter what you might have to say about yourself at times, the fact that God values you is a ground for your self-worth. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you don't have value, that you don't matter. And don't ever tell yourself that. As the old saying goes, Christ did not die for junk. He didn't give his life for something of no value. And if Christ dwells in you, you have become his temple, a holy place set apart for God. And that has great value. We do need to have a balance here, though. Don't let anyone ever tell you either that you're not a sinner. That you're fine just as you are. You don't have to change at all. And don't ever tell yourself that. We have to keep a realistic estimation of ourselves. And that includes an acknowledgement that we're all sinful people. We're all in need of regular forgiveness and ongoing change in our lives. We can't be like the person in the old ditty my grandfather used to sing to us. I love myself, I think I'm grand, I go to the movies and I hold my own hand. (laughs) That's a false self-esteem, right? When we try to convince ourselves and others, there's nothing wrong with me, I don't have to change at all. No, we all need to change. So we need to maintain a healthy balance between understanding that we're unconditionally loved and accepted by God into his family like a newborn child, because of what Christ's done for us. But also, because we're a newborn child, we have a lot of growing up and maturing to do yet. We're far from perfect. We haven't arrived yet. We won't arrive until we get to heaven. If you haven't believed in Jesus yet, your your life still definitely has value. It has dignity. But our value as God's creatures won't be enough to get us into heaven, unfortunately. Only the forgiveness Christ can provide through his death on the cross to pay for our sins will be enough to get any of us into heaven. So pray to the Lord to forgive all your sins today if you've never done that, and that he would begin this process of growth and renewal within you. Well, let me conclude quickly with three good examples for us from this passage. First, the angels. If the angels marveled and sang praises at the Christ, at the birth of Christ, how much more should we? And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. No one appreciated more than the angels did what Christ had done here, because they knew where he came from. They knew who he was, and they knew what it cost him to come down. 
they, they knew better than anyone what Jesus had sacrificed to come to earth. And they, so they sang his praises with wholehearted praise. We ought to do the same. The second good example of the shepherds. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The shepherds are great examples here for us because when they heard the good news, when they heard God's message, they immediately believed it, they immediately obeyed it, and they immediately shared it with other people. What a great example for us, especially during this Christmas season. There's an old saying, if like the shepherds you have seen and heard, then like the shepherds, go and tell. We need to do that also. Finally, there's the godly example of Jesus' mother Mary in verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. More than once in these opening chapters of Luke, we're told that when Mary heard or witnessed something God had said or done, had, or done she treasured these things up in her heart. Uh, the, the Greek words can have the sense of protect or guard. And this tells us two things. First of all, it's likely that Mary was the source of Luke's information in these opening chapters about Jesus' early life here in his gospel. Uh, Mary had treasured these things up in her heart. So when Luke came along and said, tell me about Jesus when he was young, she could tell him and he could write them down for us. These are reliable eyewitness accounts that come from Mary herself. Secondly, when the Lord shows us something or tells us something, we shouldn't just put it aside and forget about it. We should treasure it in our hearts as something valuable and reflect upon it and then act upon it just as Mary did. The words of God and the works of God are treasures. We should treat them accordingly. We should value them and preserve them, hiding them in our hearts so we can ponder them and then act on them. And that way we'll make full use of their worth as the treasures they are. God's words and works are valuable and they'll have great value for us we use them rightly in our lives. One final note. We see in the scriptures that the people God uses in great ways for his kingdom are often ordinary people living ordinary lives, just like you and me. Until the day that God summons them to some special service. When the Lord has a special task to do, he often calls ordinary people like you and me who have been serving him faithful, faithfully without any fanfare. And that's why he knows he can trust them with something bigger. Joseph and Mary, Zachariah and Elizabeth, these shepherds, they're just ordinary people who are walking with God faithfully. They're all ordinary people like you and me up until the day that they weren't. <laughs> Since they had been faithful over little, the Lord looked to them when he needs someone he could confidently set over much. In the same way, you never know how God might use you someday if you've been walking faithfully before him each and every day. The Lord's eyes go to and fro throughout the earth looking for those whose hearts are totally devoted to him. And when he has a job to do, that's who he picks. And that can be you <laughs> if you're walking with God. Let's pray. Lord, we, th we thank you that you sent us a Savior. Uh, we don't need a counselor, uh, first and foremost. Uh, we don't need an accountant. We don't need a general. But first and foremost, Lord, we need a Savior. Because only that can give us eternal life. Only that can make everything else fall into place. That's the hub of the wheel. So thank you, Lord, that this good news of great joy, that a Savior is born in the city of David, who is Christ the Lord. 
Thank you in Jesus' name.